Although those people are becoming, they're the terrorists of tomorrow. Anyone who buys this, f future terrorist. Guaranteed, allegedly. Hello everybody, welcome back to another glorious episode of Business Plays. Is it glorious? I will let you be the judge. I will just make this video and you have to tell me. If you don't like it, you are welcome to... If you want to get your hands on a shirt like this, perch the merch.co! What are we talking about? Today's video is brought to you by the glorious people over at Squarespace. Squarespace, from websites and online stores to marketing tools and analysis, Squarespace has you covered. There is a link below. I'm gonna tell you more about them in a bit because maybe you've never heard of Squarespace before. Seems unlikely. More of the worst products seen on Shark Tanks, Shark Tank slash Dragon's Den because don't we love it. Uh, the last one did really well. Uh, also, I realize Danny's introduction is uh, going to be uh, nearly two pages long, so I'm going to keep this brief. Danny writes the script. I shall read the script. Sam shall sprinkle in some fine vintage memes. We shall pay tribute to the glorious people over at Squarespace, and that is what's going to happen. There are several different ways to make an entrance into the Shark Tank or the Dragon's Den or the Goat Shed which uh, OGBB, you can stroll in confidently as if you're about to order a hamburger or you can nervously sweat and fidget and forget everything you were meant to say or you can attach a pair of roller skates to your knees and whiz straight in and out of the den without ever getting a chance to say a word. Honestly, if you've got a device, which we've talked about before, OGBB, where you're attaching roller skate wheels to your knees, it's probably best that you go in and then swiftly exit before anyone has a chance to absolutely sh** all over your dreams. I don't know who the Peter Jones of Shark Tank is, but it's like, you know, it's not gonna work out well for you. It's probably quite difficult to walk in there and immediately command respect from potential investors. They're the ones rolling around in money, and you're the one meekly holding out your empty bowl like Oliver Twist. There are a few cool ones where they, it, it turns it around because they have such a valuable product that the sharks or the dragons will fight over. There was some guy and it was like, it was a ridiculous product, like a hangover cure or something. And uh, the pitch was so convincing, the sales figures were so good that the dragons were like fighting each other off to, like get a piece of his company and I'm like Mwah. It's brilliant. Besides, if you walk in there with too much cocky swagger, you're likely to get dismissed for daring to display arrogance. Well, but one guy who did appear to command instant respect was, and attention was Dr. Floyd Seskin, who had spent 18 years as a uro urologist before wandering into the first season of Shark Tank in 2008 to pitch his big breakthrough. Over the years, many of Dr. Floyd's patients had struggled with the problem of getting caught short. It's harder to enjoy outdoor recreational activities when you're constantly worrying about the proximity of the nearest public restroom. Outdoor activities to me is like taking a walk in the woods. The great thing about taking a walk in the woods is literally everything is a toilet. It's like, I, I need to pee. Uh, okay, cool. I'm gonna go behind that bush and pee immediately. If there's no one around, I'm not even gonna go behind the bush. In particular, a full 18 hole rounds of golf isn't much fun when you're desperate for the toilet by the fifth hole and there isn't even a handy bush or tree or high striker machine to hide behind. Man, the OGBB references are strong today, Danny boy. Dr. Floyd claimed that he had finally solved this problem and the sharks were intrigued by the pioneering possibilities that could potentially potentially be pitched to the profit predators by a practicing professional. Danny, why do you do this to me? <laughs> Why? They were probably a little disappointed when Dr. Floyd pulled out a fake golf club that you could piss into. <laughs> wow. That's, uh, that's something. The Euro Club was pitched as a discreet and sanitary way to relieve yourself on the golf course. The club came to complete, uh, complete with a hidden reservoir and a triple sealed screw on lid, so all you had to do was unscrew the lid, take aim, and then pop it back in your golf bag afterwards. It's all made from sturdy material, so you're hopefully unlikely to get a hole in one. Wait, don't you want to get a hole in one? I mean, is Danny referring to peeing into the club? Wouldn't you? I mean, otherwise it's going to go everywhere, and that's not good. Then you're like, why your hands are wet? No reason! Also, if the urologist comes in and, you know, he's been practicing urology, for, that's probably the right word, isn't it? I said it like, that can't be right, but that probably is correct. <laughs> he's been practicing urology for like 18 years. And you're like, oh my god, he's come up with some incredible, like, pill or invention or something that's going to cure this problem. And it's like, no, 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 he's just invented a pot that you piss in that is the shape of a golf club with a screw on lid. <laughs> it's like, no! And if that doesn't sound particularly discreet or private, it sure doesn't, then just hold your horses. There is more to come! The Euro Club also came packaged with an amazing towel, which clipped onto the shaft of the club and served as a privacy shield. What is going on? I can't help thinking that, if anything, the privacy shield town is only going to serve to attract even more attention to the fact that you're urinating inside a golf club. And it's not going to bring much dignity to the experience. Can you imagine going to swing this golf club later? It's got this weird towel attachment. You've pissed in it. There's probably a bit of piss down the side because, I mean, 
I'm 30 and I don't always have perfect accuracy. I can't imagine some 75 year old dude who's playing golf is going to be any more accurate. It's not like you get better with practice. I've already had all the practice I need. Anyway, let's move on. But you'd be like swinging this golf club and all this like urine sloshing around inside it and you're like mate what's up with your golf club why is it making that weird sound and what was that towel thing you were peeing into earlier <laughs> but quite incredibly the euro club secured investment from a shark bravo there was a brief buzz about a sniggering when the magnificent euro club was first unveiled and shark barber barbara cock 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 it's cock. It's in English. I know she is. I've watched like clips of Shark Tank on YouTube, but I don't know if they ever say a surname. I don't know how it's pronounced. Cockeran. Cock. It was cock. Rules herself out on grounds that she couldn't relate to the product. It's true. Yeah, but she rules herself out on everything. Uh, it's true that the Euro Club does seem geared exclusively towards men, and I'm not sure what Dr. Floyd would need to invent to cater to women golfers. Maybe the Euro Pub of hot dog stand. No. He needs to attach a shiwi to that, which is a real device that a woman like somehow uh, attaches or it like something and then it has a little t look enough enough sam will probably include a picture and that does all the explaining that we need thank you sam but perhaps sensing the potential as a naughty gift shark kevin harrington was happy to invest the twenty-five thousand that dr floyd was seeking although in return for a hefty 70 percent slice of the company good lord dr floyd later admitted that he would have been happy to give up an even bigger share the euro club is still on sale today priced at 24.95 uh for the only club in your bag guaranteed to keep you out of the woods but a pop pop Marketing copy could have used some work, Floydo. And it seems that Dr. Floyd is perhaps not so keen on the novelty gift as his investor because the opening line of the product description reads rather promisingly, this may sound like a joke, but it's not. It may appear to be a subpar product, but at least Dr. Floyd managed to walk away with an investment, even if you suspect that he probably hasn't given up his day job. Yeah, I mean, he's a doctor, right? $25,000 a year. Look, I know about American doctors make a lot of money. <laughs> it's probably not gonna be a life-changing thing there uh but some of these other pitches felt as if somebody was really just taking the piss but a bob bob throcks if that i mean okay i think we're in for a treat if that was the example in the introduction that danny gives that is one that got investment i think we're in for a real treat today i'm quite excited allegedly Perch the merch .co. It seems that comedians and philosophers have spent too much time pondering over what exactly happens to all of the world's missing socks. I'm sure that most of us have experienced that crushing moment when you're sorting out the laundry and realize that one of your favorite socks has gone AWOL, leaving you with one useless sock. I, okay, I, I, I feel like I'm quite a good YouTuber in like, I go into the comments generally and I'll be like, hey, what's up? You know, like, I'll reply to people, I'll heart the things, I'll give a thumbs up. And someone just randomly commented, like, I don't know what video it was on. It wasn't on this channel. It was on some other channel. And they were like, I always wonder what happens to the socks. That's one of mankind's greatest mysteries. What happens when they go in the tumble dryer? And I just reply from, like, the main account that published the video. I take them. <laughs> and I mean, that's, like, whenever I comment on something, like, on Twitter, and the person, like, the big person I'm tweeting at replies, I'm always like, whoa, mind blown. And if they reply with something just off the wall, random and creepy, I'd be like, what is going on? <laughs> So I hope your mind has been blown. That leads us to speculate that all these single socks must somehow have jumped through a wormhole and into some more enlightened dimension inhabited by people with three feet. All right then, Danny. Uh, big brain imagination. To be honest, though, I never found it to be that much of a mystery. Just retrace your steps through the washing cycle and check that the sock didn't get stuck inside another piece of clothing. You'll usually find it. In the next Business Blaze video, we'll discuss how to handle your delicates, how to avoid shrinkages and wrinkling, and how to keep your whites bright every time. So don't forget to subscribe, because boy, is Business Blaze delivering the most thrilling content on the Y to the T, the U to the tube just to go see and get that. Maybe the missing sock dilemma doesn't didn't quite affect me so much because I went through a very long phase of wearing odd socks. This I didn't know was coming up. This is uh, sock A today. And uh, this is sock B, which is quite similar, but not quite the same. Um, they're both stripy and the same colors. It's just they're, they're slightly different. So odd socks today. Fascinating, Simon. Please tell me more about your interesting life. Can I hear it again? Why do people watch this? <laughs> I do wonder sometimes. It's honestly not because I was trying to be eccentric or alternative or because I was trying to bring down the capitalist system. It's just that going to the effort of wearing matching socks seems so utterly pointless. Why do they have to be identical? How many people are ever going to notice your socks anyway? Yes, good question. Especially now, I'm like, I, I put on a jumper this morning and I was like, this jumper is really dirty. 
it's like there's a stain there's something yesterday's lunch and it's like literally i don't see anybody i'm wearing a coat over the top then i get to the office and it's warm so i take the jumper off and i'm like i'm just not gonna dig out another jumper. i'm just wearing this i don't care and then i found there was yesterday's t-shirt inside it and i was like guess what's happening i'm not even taking that t-shirt out from the jumper and it was like this quarantine sh has really made like made me revert to 22 year old simon still for those who insist on sticking sticking to rigid conformity the san francisco entrepreneur edwin heaven quite the name edwin presented a stunning solution to the problem of missing socks at the shark tank in 2006. he was a bit of an unusual chap with an interesting history apparently he started out as a screenplay writer uh, who, and also claimed to have written literally hundreds of radio and television commercials at one point he was even the manager of the san francisco rock band the tubes never heard of them but during his pitch he came across as more of a slightly greasy Las Vegas magician than an entrepreneur. You kept, kept expecting him to invite Barbara Cochran to stand up and step inside his cabinet of delights so that she could be sawn in half. Danny, do we have to use the one with a really hard to pronounce name as the example? Like, there's another dude on there called Mark Cuban. I mean, literally, there is no. It's Cuban. It's the name of a people from a country. Easy. First name Mark. Just like you'd mark something on a piece of paper. Easy, easy peasy. Oh, hi, Mark. But would his game-changing product prove to be drenched in a kind of corporate magic? Probably not. While Miss Heaven was pitching his new product, Throx to the Sharks, and seeking $50,000 for a 25% stake in the company. The cunning idea behind Throx is that the socks were in packs of three rather than just a pair, so if you ever lost a sock through a wormhole, you'd always have a spare, and, well, that's it. Wait. There wasn't anything special about the socks. They didn't come with patented wormhole protection. They're just very cheap and ordinary socks sold in packs of three. Although Miss Heaven tried to charm the sock sharks with a sales pattern during which he proudly proclaims that Throx has legs and Throx beats the competition by a foot. But a bum bum. Ah. Uh, he wasn't destined to walk away with an investment. As Kevin O'Leary pointed out, you can't patent the idea of selling socks in packs of three, so even if the concept proved popular, the bigger and more established sock manufacturers would follow suit to wipe out Mr. Heaven's business. Kevin O'Leary chose the quite blunt words to convey his opinion, though. As he put it, they would crush you like the vampire cockroach you are. Holy sh**. Kevin. What's that even got to do with the pitch? He's just like, he's just insulting you. That's really socking it to him, Kevin. Oh! Despite this, you can apparently order Throck socks today from Mr. Evan for about $14 a set, although the website looks like it hasn't been updated for about 15 years. But I can't help thinking that Throx creates more products than it solves. It's all very well having a third sock out with emergency disappearances, but what are you supposed to do with the third sock in the meantime? You can't just bundle it together with the other two, as that would be silly. You need to set up a whole new drawer for third socks. No, you don't. You just, like when I had all black socks. I never paired them together. I just had a giant drawer, a small drawer, with a giant amount of uh, black socks in there. And you'd just reach in, you'd grab two. You never gave any thought to whether there was an odd number of socks because it didn't matter. Here's a better idea to beat the wormhole. Just buy two pairs of damn socks. You can lose two of them and still have a matching pair left over. Alternatively, place your pre-orders now for my forthcoming sets of quadra socks containing four completely different designs. So, just again, Danny, this just regular socks, no? Look, this video is full of disappointing ideas. Hopefully, if you have a business idea, it's not going to be disappointing. But, 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 the only way to work out, really, if you've got a business idea that people actually want is to, well, get it out there to the world. And the best way to do that is with today's sponsor. Squarespace. So what's going on with Squarespace? Well, you guys know this. It's a website where you build websites. That sounds meta, but it's really not, because of course you build websites on the web. It's uh, kind of what it's for. I mean, the world's a bit different these days. People are staying at home. They're starting new projects because they're bored. They're starting new projects because they're like, I need money to live. F***ing capitalism. And they're like, maybe I will start a new business. Maybe I will start a blog. And I would make fun. I'd be like, what are you going to do? Make money with a blog? And then it's like, oh, uh, I mean, I don't do a blog but I do make money making YouTube videos, which I guess is kind of a similar thing. It's weird. The world is so weird. But why not start a blog with Squarespace? It's the platform to use. And also, look, if you want to do a different business where you actually sell stuff, like a business in the traditional sense, well, you can do that too, because Squarespace absolutely allows you to sell stuff online, which is extremely cool. Also, what's great about Squarespace is they just have these beautiful templates. Like, I am a man of zero skills when it comes to design, and yet I have designed websites on Squarespace in... I made one for my wife. She was like, I need a new website, Simon. This old one ain't working out for me. And I was like, you're absolutely right. It looks 
Detroit. And she was like, that's kind of offensive. And I was like, don't worry, wife, I'll make you a new one on Squarespace. I did it on like a Saturday afternoon. I was like, how do you think of this? And then I was doing it, I'm like, why can't you do this? It's so incredibly easy. But I did it for her anyway, because I'm a wonderful man, kind, loving husband and father. And uh, God, it was ridiculously easy. And I made this beautiful looking website and mwah. Uh, what else? Oh, there's things I have to tell you about, extra features. Email campaigns, so you can keep in touch with your fans, your customers, whatever. Patronage portal, so you can ask them to give you money. <laughs> Brilliant. Social integrations, you need those. Member-only areas, you might need that. Analytics, you definitely need that to see if people are visiting your site or not. Commercial options, talked about those already. And 24-7 customer support, I've used this 24-7 customer support on Squarespace because, God, I can't even remember what issue I ran into. It was some stupid thing. And then I was like, I couldn't find it in the help file, which is extensive and good, by the way. And then I'm like, hey, Squarespace, what's up? And they were like, dude, it's right there. And I'm like, I am literally blind. I can't remember what it was. It was some stupid option to do something. And I couldn't find it. <laughs> they were like, it's literally the first thing in the menu. And I'm like, thank you, Squarespace. You legends. Uh, when you're ready to get started on the next project of yours, big or small, if it involves a website, it's got to be with Squarespace. Go to squarespace.com for a free trial. And when you're ready to launch your new site, go to squarespace.com forward slash Blaze. I thought it might be business Blaze, but it's squarespace.com forward slash Blaze, and you'll save 10% off the purchase of a website or a domain. Mmm, squirrel slaughter. I always thought that everybody loved squirrels. Maybe it's because I've never seen that many of them, and the rare sight of a cute squirrel hopping around in the distance seems like quite a special moment. I remember when I was a kid, red squirrels were really unusual. I think because the, someone imported like a gray squirrel, and then it mated with another gray squirrel, and then they ate all the red squirrels, or they ate all their food, and so the red squirrels starved or some shit. That was a bad time, but the gray squirrels are like bigger and more aggressive, and like less fun, and the red squirrels are all like nice. So if you saw a red squirrel in the wild, you'd be like, oh, shit, red squirrel, <laughs> squirrel. And now I live in, in Prague in the Czech Republic and I just go to the park in the city and there's red squirrels and shit. And I was like, oh, a red squirrel. And my wife's like, what are you talking about? It's a red squirrel. Daddy, chill. People are gonna think you're special. It wasn't until I moved to Cornwall that I first began to learn of mankind's deep hatred for the bushy-tailed nut-munching vermin. I'd walk to the local pub for local people for the very, <laughs> Thanks for the clarification. Uh, for the very first time, and there was a definite change in the atmosphere upon my arrival. If somebody had been playing the piano, they would have definitely stopped at that point. Yeah, this familiar feeling where it's like you walk into a pub, but if you, you're, you're visiting some village or something, or you're on a trip somewhere, and you're driving through a town, it's like, oh, I do need a spot of lunch. And you walk into a tiny pub, and there's like four men drinking at the bar, or in the corner, and you just walk in, and everyone just looks over you. It's like, what? You, what? And you're just like, I'll get a sandwich at the petrol station. <laughs> but I took a seat at the bar next to a chubby old bloke who appeared to be some kind of farmer pirate. Of course, Cornwall. And I managed to strike up reasonably civil conversation with him. It looked for a while as if things were going well and I was on the verge of getting accepted by the natives. But then the farmer pirate mentioned that he'd been busy setting up new lethal traps for squirrels in his back garden and he was determined to get the little bastards this time. Slightly taken aback, I told him that this seemed surprisingly cruel and I revealed how I thought squirrels were actually quite cute. At that point, he slammed his tanker down on the bar and roared, HA! Gay! He slammed his tanker down on the bar and roared, That's why city folk should never move to the country! Fuck! And he stormed out of the pub. It turns out that some people take issue with squirrels chomping their way through farmers' crops, chewing wires and cables, and nicking all the fur from food from bird feeders. The birds love it though. Like in that same park that I was talking about. Oh my god, this is just like episodes from Simon's. Someone the other day was like, Simon, why do you make a video about like a day in your life? It seems really interesting. I'm like, bro, are you kidding? Like literally. Wake up early, spend some time with my family, go to work, work a really long ass day, come home, spend some time with my family, go to bed, repeat. It's not interesting at all. Um, anyway, so I go to the park. <laughs> it's boring. This is like on the weekends. Go on a little walk. <laughs> See, look at the birds. And uh, the birds love it because the squirrels get onto the feeder that, uh, and then the squirrels like shake some stuff off as they're nicking all the bird food. And then there's just loads of birds underneath picking up the things because they're too lazy to fly up and get it. All right. It's the circle. The circle. 
Michael DeSantry from a rural area of Hawley in Pennsylvania was one such squirrel hater who was fed up with leaving out seeds and treats for his feathered friends, only to find that the squirrels were the only ones getting fat on his dollar. And it appears that squirrels don't just take a quick polite nibble, they eat the whole damn lot, and when you replace it with fresh food, they eat all that too. The birds don't get a look in. So Michael scurried into Shark Tank in 2013 with a non-lethal, if, slightly sti if still slightly startling solution to the greedy squirrel problem. He was looking for an investment of $130,000, good lord, that's a lot of money, in exchange for 40% stake in his new product, the Squirrel Boss. Michael described the product as the world's first interactive squirrel-proof bird feeder, although at first glance it looks like a fairly typical vertical hanging bird feeder. The Squirrel Boss comes packed with a literally shocking twist. Is he going to be electrocuting the squirrels? Jesus Christ, mate! The metal slides of the feeder are electrified. It will deliver a static shot shock correction to any squirrel trying to nosebag the goodies meant for the birds. Apparently, it also works on deer, raccoons, and bears. Jesus Christ, if you're wiring this up to be powerful enough to do something to a bear, you're gonna be having some cooked squirrel, mates. Although if a grizzly bear was prowling around my back garden, I'm not sure I'd be overly concerned about the seeds in my bird feed and I'd be whipping out that shotgun. Eat that mother Although the concept of grizzly bears in danger or anything like that, if they are, I'm sorry, okay? I'd still eat it. I'd still, I'd still, I'd love to try bear. I've no, I don't think I've ever eaten bear. I can't say with certainty, because I have, like, every place I go, I'll look for the weirdest food to eat. But I'm pretty sure I haven't eaten bear. Although it does feel familiar. <laughs> Weird. Let's move on. Although the concept may sound a bit barbaric, the electric shock delivered by the squirrel boss is actually quite harmless, and it is just powerful enough to deter the squirrel from coming up from second helpings. So the bears even feel this sh**? And it no doubt better for the squirrel than getting shot by, by mad Cornish farmer pirates. But the problem is with the execution. Just how did Michael manage to get around the problem of making sure his invention could tell the difference between a squirrel and a bird? Well, the answer is that he didn't. Oh no! The squirrel boss works by manual remote control. So you can't just trust it to carry out the protective duties while you're back while you're at your back turned. You have to literally stand there watching the bird feeder while holding the remote control in your hand, silently poised to push the button that will deliver a shock at the perfect moment. This just sounds like something for sadist f**ks. It's like Michael. Why? why? I mean, I get it. Like if it was automatic and it keeps the squirrels away, but this one is like when you're pressing the button. That says something about you, Mikey. And this makes the whole thing kind of pointless. If you're standing guard anyway, why not just run outside and scare away the squirrels yourself? The sharks weren't very keen on the idea, particularly as Mike was hoping to shift these bird feeders for $99 a pop. What the f are you smoking, Mikey? No one's buying that. At the very end of the pitch, an Adam and Michael announced that he refused to leave the shark tank until one of the sharks saw sense and offered him a deal. Security! In response, Kevin asked the remote control and asked Michael to put his hand inside the squirrel boss. Kevin, you legend! Michael finally took the hint and left the tank. Tank empty handed. The Squirrel Boss is on sale today, though, with the special internet price of $70, but the reviews are a mixed bag of nuts. The positive ones border on the sinister. It's as if the delirious customers just have a whale of a time spending their weekends purposefully electrocuting squirrels to see how far they jump. Those, this product should be sold, tracked, and then monitored. Like anyone who's doing that and actively enjoying it, we should keep a fucking eye on you, alright? We, uh, we should be watching. CIA, take notes. I'm sure you don't have better things to do. Although those people are becoming, they're the terrorists of tomorrow. Anyone who buys this, f future terrorist. Guaranteed, allegedly. The negative reviews point out that it doesn't take long for the crafty squirrel to figure out that only the sides of the feeder are electrified and they can still get their free crop by just holding onto the bowls and birches, which incidentally are also made of metal, but Michael decided not to bother electrifying those bits. <laughs> it's like, so basically we're saying the birds are dumb. Although crows are super smart, right? But crows don't need they know how to get food. I still say we should leave the poor squirrels alone. The birds need to get their act together. That would save us from having to electrocute anything else. The phony box. It's been a while since I saw, last saw a traditional red telephone box, though there are still apparently 2,000 of them scattered around the UK and protected from destruction on the account of being declared listed buildings of special architectural and historic interest. <laughs> wow, we live in the future, don't we? Although, when was the last time I used a payphone? I, 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 I was a kid. The last time I used a payphone, I was 100% a kid. Like a young kid. I doubt I can still shove five pence in the coin slot to make a phone call on any of them, though. The last one I remember is definitely 20p. Uh, the original KT model was designed in 1924 by Sir Giles Gilbert Scott and was actually the winning entry in a fun competition sponsored by the post office. Although initially only seen on the streets of London, variants of the original design later started sprouting up all over the UK, as well as British overseas ter territory such as Bermuda, Gibraltar, and Malta. And in 2006, the traditional red telephone box was voted is one of Britain's top 10 design icons, along with Concord, and we had to share that one with the bloody French, uh, the London Underground map, the Mini, and the Super, Emi Super Marine Spitfire aircraft, and to tan surprisingly, Grand Theft Auto? What? 
Top design icon, scan through all. Am I missing a joke? Am I missing a joke? I don't know what the joke is. Oh, I'm so dumb. Was this actually on there? Let me know in the comments below how dumb I am. I always love that. Don't I? <laughs> don't I? Sadly, you don't see much of them these days since the traditional design was phased out from 1985 onwards and then people stopped using the public payphones anyway. How will miss the sensation of scribbling around for a scrabbling around for a five pence piece in a tiny box that reeks of piss and is covered in obscene graffiti and death threats? Jesus. I don't remember. I mean, definitely graffiti stinks of piss. It's like a homeless person's urinal. Uh, and it's urinal. Everyone's like, Simon, you say urinal so weird. No. No! I just don't say urinal because I'm not f***ing American, am I? Christ! But a guy called Andrew Peters seemed quite keen to bring back the red telephone box when he arrived in the Dragon's Den in 2007. At least I think so. He was asking for an investment of $100,000 in a product that I didn't immediately understand. Okay. The phony box is a lightweight replica of a red telephone box that doesn't come equipped with a working phone. <laughs> This might sound a bit pointless, but it's not as if Andrew was trying to get these useless boxes out on the streets as a nostalgic reminder of the glorious past. It seems as if he was trying to corner the collector's market. What is this? People are just going to put these in their home? What is going on? Why would you... I mean, this is the sort of thing I imagine if I went to like, I don't know, Uber's office or WeWork. If I went to a WeWork and you go in and there's like, it's a WeWork London office, so there's a red telephone box in there and you're like, oh, edgy. F***ing <laughs> pointless. You know what I want in an office? A f***ing desk and a fast internet connection. In the book Requiem for a Red Box by John Timpson, it's noted that a telephone box is natural for the bathroom or by the pool or both. You can have one painted to fit it in a bathroom. What is going on? In the color scheme that will add value to your property, red telephone boxes create a talking point for friends and visitors. Elton John, Dudley Moore, and Tom Jones all bought a red telephone box at the same point in their lives, so the dinner conversations must have been wild. Now, what is wrong with people? What is wrong with people? But I wonder if Andrew maybe had his set sight set on the wrong sort of telephone box. I imagine that wealthy Doctor Who fans would pay good money for a phony blue police box. I must admit that I quite fancy the idea of having a TARDIS in my back garden. It doesn't need to tra travel through time and space or even feature a working telephone. Ideally, it just needs to be weatherproof. But I do wonder how many people out there would be willing to fork out a fortune for a lightweight, non-working red telephone box. And the dragon seemed largely confused by the whole pitch, which failed to secure investment. To be fair, though, Andrew did later manage to get at least a few of his phony red boxes to some high-profile locations, including most famously of all the Australian jungle setting of the UK version of the reality show. I'm a celebrity, get me out of it. Oh my god, who cares? Who cares? And he still appears to be in business today. Fancy giving him a call and leaving a message. It might just take a while for him to return your call. Hilarious! This is the worst product ever. This is the longest business play script ever. The elephant in the room. Yo mama! Before it started hiding in plain sight in the room, the ele elephant was originally attracting zero debate in the museum. An 1814 fable entitled The Inquisitive Man by Ivan Kralov told the story of a gentleman who visited a museum mm. and marveled at the tiniest details on display but completely failed to spot the star attraction of a giant elephant. Over the years, thanks in part to Mark Twain, the philosopher Alfred North Whitehead, and the New York Times, the phrase elephant in the room has evolved into a metaphorical idiom for an uncomfortable or controversial topic which has a blindingly obvious presence, yet nobody seems willing to address it. When the happily married couple Jason and Amanda Adams walked into Shark Tank in 2013, they were unusually quick to discuss the elephant in the room because that's exactly what they were flogging. They reckoned that they'd invented a cunning new tool to help address the lack of communication in troubled relationships, but neither of them were qualified marriage or relationship counsellors. I mean, if they've got a good idea for a product, I don't think they need to have like qualifications. It's not like you need to be an expert in... No, maybe you do. Maybe I'm talking sh**. In fact, it could be argued that the relatively young and recently married couple didn't have much experience with personal relationships either. Their own whirlwind romance had begun with a blind date which led to marriage just six weeks later. Yeah, okay, let's listen to these guys for relationship advice. They seem to know what they're doing. <laughs> Who gets married after six weeks? Oh, come back to me in 40 years. And then we'll talk. But it doesn't appear to have taken too long for Amanda to start getting grumpy about Jason leaving the toilet seat up. And we all know how difficult it is to start up a potentially thorny conversation which includes a bit of criticism. For the four simple words we need to talk have a tendency to strike fear and sense of doom into the hearts of even the bravest of souls. When, if I leave the toilet seat up and my wife has a problem with it, she will either A, put it down, or be like, do you have to leave the toilet seat up every time? And I'll be like, no, I apologize. I sometimes forget. I'll put it down in future. And sometimes I'll forget. Sometimes I won't. But it doesn't bother her that much. I try my best. What? This is so pointless. I'm out.
I'm out! So Jason and Amanda came up with a friendlier way to address the elephant in the room. They created the Elephant Chat. It's essentially just a stuffed toy elephant inside a glass box, and it costs $60. The idea is that when you feel the need to discuss something important to your partner, you just don't come blurting out with it. Instead, you take the stuffed toy elephant out of the box, sit it there, and hold it like a sad, hopeless moron until your partner notices and recognizes that you like to have a chat. One, this is a dumb idea. Two, just purchase a f stuffed toy elephant, or I believe Americans call them plushies, which is a brilliant word. Just purchase one of those. It's probably like three dollars come on or just print a picture out from the computer and just have that it's already sad i'm aware i'm making it sadder but that's okay we're already at like level 99 sad we're at the absolute zero of sad you can't get sadder an extra bonus feature is that you're only allowed to talk when you're holding the elephants Brilliant. Jason and Amanda had originally tried to launch Elephant Chat as a Kickstarter project, but after failing to secure investment on the crowdfunding platform, they figured it might just be easier to ask for pots of money from rich people on TV. It's not gonna be easier. They're gonna say f off. The happy couple were seeking $50,000 in exchange for 70% of the Elephant Chat. Good lord. But the sharks weren't in the mood for any prolonged discussion over this. Kevin O'Leary highlighted the obvious problem. It's just a stuffed elephant. Even if there are some couples out there who feel capable of conducting a serious conversation whilst holding a stuffed toy elephant, what's stopping them from just spending $2 on an alternative stuffed toy elephant instead of forking out $60 for a stuffed toy elephant in a glass cage? Excellent point, Kevin. Who would have thought of that? Roy Herjavets. Dude, why is with your name? The, the, the shark's names, Robert Her Her Herjavets. The names are so complicated. Was perhaps the most optimistic shark, encouraging the couple to come and pitch him, pitch him again after 23 years of marriage. <laughs> yes. So that he could see concrete proof that the concept worked. That's never going to happen, though. Jason and Amanda divorced shortly after, shortly after leaving the tank and became involved in very messy and public spats about custody of their child. They had a child. Oh! It's like blind date, married after six weeks, get divorced, but before that, had a child. You've just made a string of errors. Uh, maybe that toilet seat thing was a deeper problem than we thought. It's clearly too big for the elephant to handle. Amanda should have banned Jason from the bathroom and brought him a Euro club to take outside into the garden so they could do his business. A complete privacy among the ever-mounting piles of fried squirrels and grizzly bears. This has been an episode of Business Place brought to you by the legends over at Squarespace. Get hooked up with some Squarespace below if you'd like some fine merch. Purchase the merch.co. Thank you for watching. Legend. Because you watched all the way to the end. We haven't done that in a while. Legend. Cock. It was cock.